Welcome to this video by Scholar Leaders. I'm delighted to share this material with you on how to read for your PhD, and I hope that it will be helpful for you in your own scholarly journey. Reading for the PhD is a special skill. I've seen people who try to read every page of every source on their exam's reading list. This is incredibly time consuming and often confusing because you get deep into technicalities you aren't yet prepared to understand. It's therefore demoralizing. It can also be a drain on your relationships with your family as they see you spending so much time on your study but not getting anywhere. My goal is to help you not only avoid this situation, but excel in your reading and, eventually, in your scholarship. I'd like to begin with a metaphor. I grew up in the middle of the United States. We used to go to the mountains every summer for our family holiday. Mountain lions lived there, and as kids we used to scare ourselves by imagining we'd seen or heard one. They're extremely dangerous if you're unfortunate enough to encounter one, they eat only meat, they're at the top of the food chain, they're apex predators, picky and ferocious. On the other hand, my childhood friends own goats. The goats went everywhere eating everything. Thorn vines, poison ivy, grass, clothes that blew off the line, everything. When you're reading for your PhD, you can be tempted to be like a goat and read everything every sentence. But you need to be like the mountain lion. Hunt the meat. Don't eat everything. Have command of your territory. Take only the best from it. Be lion, not goat. Or, to use another metaphor, your goal when reading for your PhD should be to build a sense of conversation with your own project at the center. Think of the literature in your field as a room full of people having a conversation. You want to know all the different voices in that conversation, sure, but you want to know how they fit together, who's disagreeing with whom, who's only partly disagreeing, etc. And most importantly, you want to keep your voice, your project, at the center. Your project is the grandfather toward whom everyone else is talking. To take the metaphor further, you also want to be sure that you get longer, deeper conversations with the most important people, rather than scurrying from conversation to conversation with everyone, or getting stuck with just one person in a long, irrelevant conversation that eat up, eats up the night. In other words, carefully choose the two to three scholars who are most important for your project and work with them. Let the other scholars live in the footnotes. So, keep your project at the center of the conversation. Or, be the mountain lion, and take only what you need to make that happen. My goal in this session is to help you think about some strategies that will help you do this. Before we begin, a caveat. Of course, you will need to read all of some sources. But that's the hunting mentality. Think about which resources you'll probably return to for the rest of your career and read those thoroughly. To help you do this, remember that it's your supervisor's job to help you figure out which resources are those big game. Ask them, out of this reading list of 100, to which 6 to 12 resources do I need to pay most attention? between your supervisor and some of the other strategies we'll talk about, focus on what's most important. So when you confront a long reading list for a class, for your comprehensive exams or your upgrade viva, for your proposal, for a literature review, whatever it may be, what do you do? I'm going to share a set of interconnected strategies to help you think about this. Strategy number one, build a template that you will complete for each resource. A template will help you glean only the most relevant information for your project. Remember, be the lion, not the goat. 
A template will help you find that information again quickly when you're revising or writing. I'm going to share the template I use, but it's only a suggestion. You might find adjustments that work better for you. You can use this template for a full book, an essay within a book, or an article. Whether you use my template or one that you create yourself, think about the following elements. First, bibliographical information. Make sure you capture the full bibliographical information for the source at hand. This way you can drop that information easily into the bibliography or footnotes of your writing without having to track it down again. So as you can see in this entry in my template, I've got the complete bibliographical details for Mary Carruthers' book, The Craft of Thought. Second, what's the big question? What question is this scholar trying to answer in this resource? And again, you can see that I've distilled it here. Um, Carruthers' main question is, how did medieval monks use memory, and why did they use it that way? In the simplest possible terms, in my own words. Then, you want to summarize the author's main argument. What's the single most important big idea this author explores? What's their answer to the big question? I really emphasize going light on quotes here. Try to use your own words to summarize and digest the material as much as possible so that you can really learn and gain mastery over the material, so that you can really internalize it, especially for a viva or an oral exam situation. At the same time, be sure to capture page numbers so that when you've got key concepts in this part of your template and you want to use those in your writing, you can just easily refer back to those pages when you're writing about them. The next part of the template is the methodology. How does this author go about exploring their topic? What kind of evidence do they use? And I've summarized here, again in my own words, Carruthers surveys medieval memory texts and she does close readings of those texts. That's how she makes her argument. Next, I summarize the main points. And in this section, I really concentrate just on the author's main points that relate to my own argument. I don't try to cover all of their main points. Again, just the ones that are tied to my argument, what I need. So I've chosen three to four main points here for a handful of Carruthers chapters. Chapter one, she talks about how memory uses structures. Chapter two, she talks about visual forms of memory. And then in chapters three to five, she basically gives some case studies, some tools for memory. And as you can see, I've just summarized them because I don't need to explore every one of them for my project. The next part of the template is where we go back to that idea of the conversation. Who are the key scholars with which this source interacts? So the key scholars for Carruthers are medieval, Augustine, Bede, the Bible, for example, um, parts of medieval culture more broadly, cloisters, dream visions, the gospels, and then some contemporary or modern thinkers, Theodore Adorno and Marx. So I just summarized very quickly which scholars are part of Carruthers' part of the conversation, her corner of the room, if you will. Finally, I summarize the relevance of this source to my project. How does Carruthers fit with what I'm trying to do in my own project? And this is really important because this is where I'm starting to develop Carruthers' work, again, in relation to my project. So Carruthers, is an essential historical study. She provides background for what I'm trying to do. Second, she disregards a key distinction that I also want to disregard, so she legitimizes what I'm doing. Furthermore, the kind of theory that I'm using, absorption theory, isn't something that Carruthers actually uses herself, but the way she talks about medieval memory is very similar to absorption theory. So I can use Carruthers and extend her, I'll talk more about that in a moment, I can extend Carruthers' argument 
into absorption theory, even though she doesn't actually talk about it explicitly herself. So I'll summarize her by saying she provides me with background, she legitimizes one of the choices I make, and I'm extending her argument, which is a really important thing for me to do as a scholar. So those are the basic aspects of the template. And if you're interested, you can look at the Word document and download it and repurpose it for your own scholarly pursuit, your own template. Okay, now that you have your template, what are you going to do with it? Are you just going to set it aside until you've finished reading the entire book or article? Of course, the answer is no. I got all of this information by using the template while I read. The template helps to guide my reading. Fill the template out as you go. Look for the details that will fill in each block of the template, and after you've filled in those blocks, move on. For instance, once you've got a handle on the author's argument, move on to the next thing. What are the key scholars, for example? Uh, what are the chapters you need to summarize? Of course, you'll probably have to adapt the structure for your own needs, but you'll find that this way of reading that's very focused and structured becomes more natural over time. Of course, I understand that this idea of moving on from one aspect of a text to the next sounds extremely risky and challenging. But remember, you're a lion, not a goat. You only want the meat. What will pack in the most calories the fastest? If you browse everything, you're in danger of becoming exhausted. So let's explore some other strategies for making this work. With your template to one side and your book or article to the other side, what do you do to translate that high resource into high value content in your template? Strategy number two, let the table of contents guide you. Whether you're looking at a monograph or a collection of essays, read over the table of contents. What information can you glean from the table of contents alone that can help you fill out your template for this book. And again, I've given you an example here from my own scholarship. Um, this is the table of contents for a book called Lyric Tactics by Ingrid Nelson. So I might ask, what are some key terms here that might be part of Nelson's argument? What one to two chapters in this monograph or essays, if it's an edited collection, look especially interesting? I might note those and plan to read them in detail, but not the others. So for example, I know I want to read the introduction. I'll talk about that in a moment. Because my project focuses on short Middle English poems, I know I want to read chapter one because Harley 2253 is full of short Middle English poems. Chapter two also is about hymns, which are short Middle English poems. So I'll want to read chapter two as well as chapter one. But even though chapter three has the word lyric in the title, and I might think that that's a short poem, it's actually not. I know that Troilus and Crusade is a very, very long poem. So I'm going to skip chapters three and four. I'm not gonna read them because they're not about short poems, which is what my project is focusing on. I'll just read the introduction, chapter one and chapter two. Next strategy ties into this one, strategy number three, focus on the introduction and on one or two key chapters. In particular, introductions can be the single most valuable part of a book or article or a collection of essays. Introductions are where the author gives an overview of the whole work. Again, no matter whether it's an article, a monograph, or a published set of edited essays, the introduction will always lay out the overall argument, the primary ways in which the author will back up that argument, and the structure of the rest of the work. Whether that's by providing chapter summaries for a monograph, essay summaries for a collection of essays, or section summaries for an article. By reading the introduction very carefully, you will learn what the whole book is about. You will fill out your template 
And then you don't have to read the book, or at least not the whole thing. So I really encourage you to use the introduction to complete your template. Now, if the book contains one or two chapters or essays that focus directly on material that you will use in your project, of course, read those as well. Read them carefully, thinking always about how to keep your project at the center. To get the gist though, even here, focus on the opening paragraphs and the concluding paragraphs of each chapter, where, again, the author will lay out what they're arguing and why. Even when you're reading a chapter, you want to be targeted and strategic. Conclusions can also be helpful to books, although usually they're less so. They're often shorter and less detailed than the introduction. For an article, focus on the opening section and one or two key sections, which you can usually choose by looking at headings, which headings sound interesting or related to your topic. Strategy number four, explore the conversation. Keep an eye out for the big scholars who are mentioned by several different books. Which scholars does everyone else reference? Read those. If needed, you can also look at book reviews. If you can't find a book in the library, try to see if you can find a couple of reviews of that book online in a database. Book reviews will summarize the book enough for you to get a good idea of the author's argument. Book reviews are especially helpful for getting a sense of conversation between sources. If you want to know where a really important book sits in the conversation, read a few reviews. Reviews should help you get a sense for who disagrees with whom, what material or research questions people left out, etc. Again, this can help you digest where someone sits in the scholarly conversation. Strategy number five, keep a for later document. This strategy can help to get around the sense of danger or um, tenuousness from reading so, so strategically. Create a separate document from your dissertation or your conference paper, class paper, whatever it is you're working on, and call it ideas for later or something like that. When you come across a quote or a scholar that you really love, that really interests you, but you determine right away that they're not really necessary for your project, note them in that document. Save there all the things that you like, but that are not directly related to this project. The interesting people in the conversation who ultimately aren't saying anything helpful for you right now, but to whom you can come back later. Again, this can help to counteract that sense of tenuousness because you're saving that important material in another place. Strategy number six. This is really key for digesting important material. Mark it up. Within an introduction or a very important chapter, how do you read? Well, I really encourage you to print off or use hard copies whenever you can. Science shows that reading on hard copies will help you retain information much more effectively than reading digital copies. I know this is difficult because I don't have access to a strong library myself right now, but I really encourage you whenever possible, use hard copies. On a hard copy, you can underline or star or bracket the main argument or important sub-arguments. You can number the main points for yourself. Often an author's prose might do this for you, but I find it helpful to make numbers in the margins myself so that the structure of the argument gets into my own head. And this way I can dog ear, I can keep track of page numbers, I can scribble question marks or exclamation points in the margins. I really, again, encourage you whenever possible to mark it up. In line with that, and again, reiterating here, use hard copies whenever possible, underline main arguments, number or star main points, 
circle important or unfamiliar words, all of this on your hard copy whenever you can. Digest the meat. Strategy number seven. So in line with marking it up, in line with using the template, after you've hunted down that meat, don't forget to digest it. Engage in conversation. That's another way to think about this. Ask questions. What doesn't make sense to you in this source? Why? Write it out. Note where you or another source you might have read might disagree with this source. Where do you hear a voice shouting, hey, that's not right? Note where this source might back up your argument, where you might agree together, where you're saying, hey, yeah, that makes sense. Note where you might extend this source's argument into new territory, which remember is what I was doing with Carruthers earlier, um, saying, okay, she's focused on this way of doing things, but I'm going to extend it into my argument. Think of yourself again as in a conversation with this author, talking, them, talking to them in a room full of other texts, both primary and secondary. And here's an example from my own reading. This template entry is for Eric Weiscott's English alliterative verse. And you can see I've circled here, hey, it would be interesting to add this to the chapters on these topics because the source might connect to those primary sources. I've noted down some questions. I've noted down where this source is most useful. Similarly, again, back in Carruthers, I've highlighted in yellow here how another critic, Chazelle, actually explicitly critiques Carruthers' idea. So here's an instance of conversation between two other texts. Ultimately, you want to be in control. Have mastery. Ask questions of the texts in relation to your project. While, of course, there will be certain contexts in which you'll want to represent another author's ideas, Early career scholars like us often spend an excessive amount of time describing what other people think, instead of moving on to describe what they think. They like to summarize. And that's understandable because we want to show how much we know, but that's ultimately not acting like a lion, like a scholar, which is what we are. When a lion downs a gazelle, it doesn't delicately replate the meat, take a photo for Instagram, summarize it in every detail, it devours that meat, it breaks it down into its more basic nutrients and resynthesizes the protein to make itself stronger. So unless you're writing a book review, this should be your instinctive move. Process the components of an author's argument in a way that makes your argument stronger. Or build a sense of conversation with your own project at the center. No speed dating, no getting trapped with one crusty uncle in the corner. Choose the most important people. So to conclude, I'd like to reiterate, be a lion. Take only what you need, then move on to the next source. Build a sense of conversation with your own project at the center. Again, I hope this material is helpful for you. Happy reading. May you grow and thrive as a scholar.